Lower's good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Oh boy, here we are. Well, good morning. I wanted to share with you uh, a card, actually, that I received about a week and a half ago from Wendy. And I didn't see her this morning. Is she here? There you are. Okay, very sweet card. She just wanted to tell me she was thinking about me and praying for me. But what I wanted to share with you was what she writes at the top. She um, summarizes Psalm 121, and she says this. She says, I look to your hills and mountains for strength, wisdom, and rest. And then she writes, rest with four munchkins. Ha, 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 (laughs) ha. Which I so appreciated. And if you don't know what she's talking about, um, the ones that were here laying back, leading that whole thing, those were, I think, mostly mine. So you know what I'm dealing with. But um, anyway, here we are, the third part of a three-part series. So children of God, saved by grace, and then today we're going to be talking about free to love. So just as a recap, a couple weeks ago, Greg talked about being children of God. And if you were here, you remember he brought out some of Dave's um, paintings, which were just beautiful and we were all very excited about. And he talked about God as the painter, the artist, who created us and who is constantly working on us and crafting us and making us into his beautiful masterpiece. And even more than that, God knew us before. Before we even came into being, before we were even in our mother's womb, he knew us. I was just reading that this week from Jeremiah, and how fantastic is that, that he knew us before we were even in the womb, and then he's been crafting us and working on us ever since. And the positional truth is that God then takes us and he places us in relationship to him as his children, which is a really beautiful thing. And then last week, we talked about being saved by grace, and Greg talked about how God has taken us from a place over here and brought us to a place over here. And the place over here is um, where sin and death and suffering reign, where there's darkness and hopelessness. And then over here is where there is healing, acceptance, restoration, new life, forgiveness, and freedom. And everything about how we were brought from here to here is all about God's deep love for us. And it's only by his grace then that we experience this transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So that's say by grace. Now today, what we get to talk a little bit about is what does it mean now that we're here, having placed our faith in Christ, have, being here, what does it look like then to live here in this place? This place that scripture actually calls the kingdom of God. So just as a frame of reference, a few things about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is um, not an actual physical place. It's not a building. It's not somewhere that we can, you know, walk up to and knock on the door. And actually, Jesus says this about, I think I put it in here, yes, um, about the kingdom of God. The Pharisees had been coming to them and asking him, well, when's the kingdom of God coming? Because you keep the, they were talking about it. You know, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is near. When is it coming? And Jesus answered, and he said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Okay, so we're talking about a spiritual kingdom. The other thing is that there is not a physical ruler on this earth governing the kingdom, okay? There's no one holding a council meeting trying to figure out how how the kingdom of God is going to work. But we do have a king. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus, and he's the one who is in control and who we're looking to for direction. And then the other piece is that um, in the kingdom of God, um, we are not, um, uh, we don't have to be following a bunch of rules. One of the things that we were freed from over here were the high demands of the Old Testament law. And so over here, we don't have that. We don't have, you know, a bunch of guidelines, do's and don'ts, but we do have one, and that's love. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So would you just pray with me before we jump into our scripture? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for bringing each one here today, God. And I thank you that whatever we've brought here today and wherever we're at, God, you knew that before we even came. 
and you know what we need, and you want to meet us there, and I just ask humbly that you would do that, that we would be open to that, and that you would just fill me with your word. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. We give it to you. Amen. Okay, so what does it mean to be freed to love? So the essence of Christian freedom is basically the type of life that we get to live in the kingdom of God. And it's a really high calling, actually. And we live here with purpose because we weren't freed from over here to come over here and then just do whatever we want. Okay, but we were freed um, to, to love, but the, the, how do I say this? The, um, the limits, if you will, of that freedom are God's standard for his kingdom. And God's standard for his kingdom is the law of love. So when we choose not to love, we are actually not living for what that freedom was made for in the first place. This isn't the best illustration, but it's kind of what I think of when I think of this idea. Um, I I read a study several years ago about uh, an elementary school where um, kids were observed as they went out to recess and to play on the playground and explore the, you know, the grass area and all that kind of stuff. And basically, in the first part of the study, um, there was no fence between the um, playground and the street. And so what they noticed as they observed them, they would let them out for recess, and they would kind of huddle closer to the buildings. They, you know, they, they would play a little bit out here and there, but they, they basically stayed close to the buildings, and, um, and they weren't enjoying the whole area that they had. And the second part of the study, they did put up a fence between the, the playground and the street, and what they began to notice is the kids would, would explore, and they felt freedom to enjoy the whole space that was given to them to enjoy for the purpose of recess and having fun and playing. And they did that what their conclusion was that they felt safe and they knew what was expected of them. And God's kingdom is a little bit like that because God, he freed us and he wants us to enjoy that freedom. He really does. And he wants us to be able to explore everything that the kingdom has to offer, but he does have his boundary up and that boundary is love. And all he's saying is in this place, there will be love. So I hope that helps you understand it a little bit, but We're going to look at a passage today from Galatians. Um, This is a letter from Paul. He's actually probably most likely planted the the Galatian churches on his missionary churches. So he's writing to people he knew, and um, he's writing specifically to... um, You gave me a weird face. Um, No, it's okay. (laughs) I'm like... "Ah." Um, he's writing specifically to an issue of legalism. So basically the Jewish Christians in Galatia were still trying to tell the Gentile Christians that they had to be circumcised, among other things, in order to be saved. So they're going back and they're putting themselves under the bondage of the law. And so Paul is writing to them and he's saying, listen, there, this is, you're not understanding what you've been freed from and what you've been freed for. So Galatians Um, Chapter 5, verse 13, verses 13 through 15 is what I'm going to read. So, for you were called to freedom, brothers, brethren, I should say, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Okay, so he starts with a simple reminder that you were called to freedom. You and I have been called to freedom. And then he jumps right in into what that freedom is not. So that freedom is not an opportunity for the flesh. Or maybe your versions might say it is not an opportunity to indulge the flesh. Now, flesh is not, um, at least here when Paul's talking about it, he's not talking about um, the physical part of a human. He's talking about an unspiritual life. A life that is being governed by ego and not by the Holy Spirit. A life that is continually filling itself with unspiritual things and finding itself empty. 
Actually, I, kinda, I like the word indulge because it kind of makes me think of um, pampering myself, maybe spoiling myself a little bit. And when we spoil the flesh, the unspiritual life, then we're just we're going to be left with, with nothing, really. We're going to be left empty and unsatisfied. And um, actually, in the, in the class that we've, um, I don't even like to call it a class, but the group on Sunday mornings, um, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about just the different things in our lives, those cycles, those patterns we have where we just keep sticking the same thing in and it's just not working. And that can be anything from alcohol and drugs to today we talked about control, we've talked about relationships, we've talked about um, money, exercise, food, we've talked about all sorts of things. And just the truth of it is, is those things cannot satisfy, only God can satisfy. And, and Paul is saying that when then you indulge the unspiritual life, you're actually, in a sense, you're putting yourself back into a bondage, and you're not experiencing freedom anymore. And he's saying, just, I don't, you know, don't do it, because if you do it, you're going to end up destroying yourself. So we're freed, but there are guidelines. And that's when he goes into the next thing. So now he's saying, this is what, do not use your freedom for this, but do use it um, through love to serve one another. I can't see. I need to come see you, Joyce. Um, (laughs) Through love, serve one another. (sighs) How magnificent is it that what we are called to do with our freedom is the very thing that purchased our freedom in the first place. Servitude. I just get goosebumps even thinking about it. And I love, um, earlier we read from Philippians 2, but I'm going to read it just a a part of it again because it's so powerful. He says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being formed in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I know. Amen. I just love that passage. I also love, um, there's an essay by Martin Luther called On Christian Freedom, and he wrote it during the time of the Reformation, which if you don't know much about that. That's basically when um, the Catholic Church, a a part of the church, broke off and is now called Protestantism, and that's kind of where we find ourselves. But he was in the middle of of the Reformation, and there was a lot of debating going on. There was a lot of conflict. There was division. And in the midst of that, he wrote this wonderful unifying work called On Christian Freedom, and this is what he said. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Let me say that again. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And actually, Luther, in his writings, when he talks about... um, um, how did I say this? Oh, it talks about freedom. He sees it as being synonymous with bondage to the Spirit. Which, again, our minds kind of, it, it, I don't know, it's a little bit of a paradox, right? Because we've been freed for bondage. But that's really pretty much the same thing that Paul is saying in the Galatians. He's saying you need to live not an unspiritual life, but a life in the Spirit. And a life where everything is done out of love and not out of law or obligation to the law. Luther also says that this type of love by its very nature is ready to serve and be subject to those who are loved. So, why is love that serves the needs of others the means for which which Christian freedom is, is expressed? Love that serves the needs of others. What I think Paul is wanting us to get here is that if it's not a love that's serving the needs of others, it's probably not love. And if we're not serving the needs of others, then really we're being, not being selfless, we're being selfish. And selfishness goes back to what he just talked about, which is indulging the flesh. So here we go. If it's not a love that serves the needs of others, it's, it's probably not love. 
Now, the next thing Paul does is he gives a, a command. And he says, uh, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting that he doesn't say, if you love yourself, then love your neighbor that way. Or when you love yourself, do that also for your neighbor. He's pretty much assuming, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know it's true, that we love ourselves. Now, self-love doesn't necessarily mean that we have high self-esteem, that we're ready to conquer the world, that we think we're above and beyond other people. But the idea of self-love is that in each of us, there is a propensity to make ourselves comfortable. Okay, simple things. If we're cold, we put on a coat. If um, we can't see, we go to our eye doctor. Um, If we're hungry, we eat. And it's with that same kind of self-care that, that, you know, we should, Paul would say, you know, use that as a measuring rod, basically, a measuring stick for how you're to care for others. And actually, we should use all the energy and the perseverance and the creativity that we put into doing good things for ourselves, into doing good things for others, right? It's, uh, I, the more I thought about this, the more convicted I, I, I got, and I think it's really something that takes quite a bit of self-examination. But again, Paul, okay, so Paul is continuing to redefine what love is, and he's saying that it's not about the law, although this command is a command and actually does come from the Old Testament law, but the, the purpose any, anymore isn't just to fulfill it, by deeds, but to fulfill it out of an outpouring of the grace that is given to us from God, the grace that saved us from here to here. See, when Paul is writing the Galatians, and it's the same as us, he's writing post-crucifixion, right? And so it is in light of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that we are now given back our propensity to love. We were, we were made to love. We were made with that that in us but with the fall and with sin that's kind of been corrupted along the way but in his grace he comes in and he restores that and he gives us the holy spirit to guide us which is so cool so we're not freed and then abandoned but we do have to realize that the the freedom and our ability to love is only going to be what it's meant to be if it's rooted in the one who first loved us so, um, now the, uh, the next part, and I kind of, I kind of love that Paul did this. Let me read it first. He says, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. And the reason I love this is because I feel like I do this every day with my children. Say, I tell them what's expected. And then I tell them the consequence if they don't do <laughs> what I'm telling them to do. And it's a little different here for Paul because he's, he's not even saying, don't do this or this will happen. He's saying, if you keep on doing it. So now there is the assumption that they're already doing it. It's already going bad, and it's going to get really a lot worse. When I was thinking about this, um, I was actually thinking about it in the car, and then we had a little situation arise, which, unfortunately, it happens more often than I'd, I'd like to admit. But I'm in the car, and I'm thinking about this, and then all of a sudden, the problem. For really thirsty kids and one full water bottle. I know, right? It's awful. So I'm driving along and I hear one of them says, I'm thirsty. And then within like five seconds, all of them are literally going to fall over if they don't get water like (laughs) right away. And so I say, okay, I have my water bottle. I will pass it back to Piper. She's usually right behind me. I'll pass it back to you. Take a sip and pass it along, right? Share with your siblings. Okay, so I pass back the water to Piper. And no sooner than I do that, but Ruby's screaming. Why? I don't even know. Probably because I gave it to Piper and not her because she's here. And so sometimes I do that. I don't know, but usually I do this. And so maybe that's why she's screaming. I don't know. But then before I know it, Tad, he's in the back. And he's screaming because Piper is definitely taking more than her share of the water. (laughs) And then Sam starts screaming again. I don't even know why. Maybe because... 
cat is screaming. I'm not even sure what's going on. So then I look in my mirror, and then I see Piper, and she's passing it across to Ruby, and she has like that smirk on her face because she knows she totally just took more water than she should have taken. And then Ruby takes her little tiny sip and then throws the water bottle, I'm not lying, underneath the passenger seat so that nobody can even get it anyway. So then the boys in the back, of course, break out into another like fit because now they haven't even gotten any water, and they will surely die because they are that thirsty and basically the only reason they're not biting and devouring each other is because they're still buckled into their seatbelts. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure of it. But I just had this picture of, oh, why can't they just take a sip and pass it? It's not that hard. But they're not concerned about being selfless. They're not concerned about serving each other. They're not concerned about treating the other one as they treat themselves or treating them the way they want to be treated or any of that. They're concerned about one thing, getting what they want. And it's this kind of attitude that Paul is writing into. And he's saying, you know what? You are so consumed by your own agendas that you're putting that over freedom. And if you keep on doing it, you better watch out because you are going to destroy each other. So I love this picture that Paul gives of, um, of what it means to be free to love. And I just want to expand it a little bit because I really believe that our ability to love others and to serve others is fundamentally, fundamentally connected to our relationship with God. So I do this because I think of it as being a vertical and a horizontal thing. So when this relationship is strong, when this relationship is good, then this tends to be better also, right? So Paul here to the Galatians, he, he quotes the second part of what we call the Shema. It comes from Deuteronomy, um, but it's, it's quoted also in the New Testament. And he quotes the second part, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, earlier in the Gospels, when some of the Pharisees come to him, and they ask him, okay, we're looking at the law, the Old Testament law. What is the most important part about this thing? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. But again, there is something so deeply connected to um, what is going on with us and God in terms of our ability um, to to then offer love to each other. Sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, I've sort of, <laughs> I've sort of hesitated sharing this next thought with you. I keep going back and forth. Greg says do it, so I'm gonna do it. Um, and I want to do it because honestly, I know what I would be thinking if he or somebody else was standing up here, kind of sharing what I just shared and. Um, and the idea of, you know, our relationship with God being connected to how we are able to love others. What I would be thinking is, yeah, that is so true. I'm, I'm glad she just read that verse. I, yeah, that's right. That's not happening for me. I, yeah, okay, this week I, I'm definitely, I got to get back into this. Yep, I got to, I got to work on this thing because it'll, it'll help the other areas. So yeah, I better, I better, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to journaling and, and praying more this week and doing my quiet times and, you know, maybe, maybe I'll hit up that Sunday school class or, or you know, what, what can I do? I, yeah, I, I definitely need to do that, make a note to myself. Because we all agree that when our relationship with God is stronger, then, then our ability to live out his kingdom and his will and his desire for us is better. But... And this is the thing I've been learning a lot lately is the more we try to to do this, the more we will ourselves, the more we try and check things off the list, the the, the farther away that we actually get from it. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's a, a guy named Father John who uh, he comes and he helps us out um, at Prodigals a little bit, but he has a way of saying it where he says, effort is the enemy. So if effort's the enemy, then what are we to do? Not try? <laughs> well, and this is where it gets a little bit um, different. It's something I'm learning, but I promise it is so life-changing. What I've learned is that because God is always with us, 
wherever we go, all the time. We don't have to look for him. We don't have to make an appointment with him. We're the ones who are busy. He's there. This relationship actually is already there. But we have to be awakened to the fact that he's, he's there. And he's just sort of waiting for us to acknowledge him. And so in my life, it's been a simple, hi, God. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but you should seriously try it because it's, <laughs> it's awesome. You can be driving the car. You could be, you know, eating your dinner. Father John says he's, a lot of times he's just shaving, so he's looking in the mirror, and all of a sudden he just says, hi, God. You're there. And as we do that, there's something, I, I'm telling you, there is something in my spirit that just releases. And somehow I'm then able to go in this place where I'm recognizing God's love for me. And then, what Father John says, he says, then pay attention, because, whoa, God will give you so many opportunities to love. And he will show you so much about what he's doing in the world around you. So... Take that for what it's worth. It's, uh, it's really been life-changing for me. Now, the other piece that I, I wanted to add is that, um, okay, so we love God, we love others, and in John 13, in the upper room, Jesus is with his disciples at the Last Supper, and he's just excused Judas to go, go do his thing and betray him, and he turns to the rest of them and he says, okay, now I have another command. It's a new command, and I want you to love each other as I have loved you. So now we have an example, a human example, somebody who lives here, who who knows what it's like to be in our flesh. And so we love as he loved. So we love God, we love others, and we love as Jesus loved. Now, what is the other option? I need to read to you a passage, also from Paul, but it's in his letter to the Corinthians. Um, And honestly, when I think about love and being free to love, and then I read this passage, my insides get a little bit um, unsettled. Because if we take it seriously, and we ought to take it seriously, um, we should really think carefully about our actions. So this is from 1 Corinthians. It says, If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So what Paul seems to be implying here is that it's not actually about the act. Of love, but it has everything to do with the condition of the heart of the one doing the love. So we can be doing nice, kind, loving, sacrificial things all day long, but when they're not done in the right heart, then he warns it's just going to be a bunch of pointless noise and it's not going to profit you anything. That's a tough one for me. Now, does that mean that God, you know, doesn't use acts of love that are not done in the right heart. No, God uses, he can use anything for his good, no matter what the original motive was. We know that. I see it all the time. And yet Paul is still saying when something is done with the wrong motive, there's something about it that's not love, and it does have consequences. So the consequences would be, like on the one who's receiving. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but... When somebody does something that is loving, but it doesn't really seem all that genuine. It seems like it's really more about them. And it doesn't really feel all that good. So there's that kind of love. There's being on that end. But I think more importantly, it's, it's the consequence falls on the one who is offering the love. Because when our hearts aren't right, and I am so speaking to myself as much or more than I'm speaking to you, if our hearts are not right, our attempts are not going to accomplish the kind of love we are freed for. And the reason that they don't accomplish the kind of love that we're freed for is because we're missing out, really, in the end. So we're, we're on the playground, okay? 
right? We're in the kingdom on the playground, and um, we're, 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 we're on the playground, but we're not like in the game. We're in a timeout, okay? Because we're not playing by the rules, and the rule is the law of love. So when we're, when we're ceasing to love in that way, we're having to sit out. Now, we don't get removed from the playground. Let me make that very clear. There is nothing that on our own volition that got us into the kingdom, and there is nothing that we can do that would make God remove us into the kingdom. That is all about grace. It is not about works. But as we function in the kingdom, when we cease to love that way, we kind of take ourselves out of it. And maybe we can see it from our bench. Maybe not. Maybe we got put, put behind the tree. Maybe we can hear it. But we're not experiencing it in the same way. And that's a really sad thing. John Piper says, uh, says this. He says, Love is motivated by the joy of sharing our fullness. But the works of the flesh are motivated by the desire to fill our emptiness. So you can see it's a high calling to live in the kingdom. And it's really not always that easy or comfortable. And if it is, I don't know, that might be something you want to want to reflect on. But um it's really it's really a, a it's a challenge. And I'm not saying that all parts of learning what it means to be free to love are hard. Okay, I, I actually really do enjoy doing things for other people. I love seeing when I've hit the nail on the head and it's just something that is just really caring and really meaningful to someone. Um, being selfless, especially with people who are selfless with me, I find that very, very easy. I love to serve my friends, those people that I connect naturally with. There are parts about loving that come natural, that, that are easier, I guess you could say. But that's, not, that's only a part of what we've been freed for. The, the type of love we've been freed for is more holistic, and so it also includes those places that we don't know how to love because we've been so wounded and so hurt that we're not even sure what it means to stand in that place and love. Or to deal with that person or that situation where you're, you're, you're wanting to be a loving presence, but you just really cannot for the life of you figure out why they're thinking the way they're thinking. Or, or maybe it's just the simple act of letting somebody be who they are. I don't know if that resonates with you, but sometimes one of the hardest things for us to do is love somebody for who they are and where they're at. The type of love that we're freed for should impact us. It should be something that we feel. My theology professor, actually, um, through North Park for my ordination class I took it this last spring, she talks about the, um, the working out of Christian freedom as being a spiritual discipline. And she says this. She says, it requires habituation, development, and work, but ultimately it moves us toward a deeper love and communion with God. And I love that because when you think about the typical spiritual disciplines and you look at prayer and contemplation and confession and worship, you think about things that we choose to do, but as we choose to do them, God intervenes and he meets us in those places and he shapes then this new way of looking and seeing the world and seeing how he sees. And so even as we choose to love, God meets us there and he shaped us. And as we practice them, um, he shows us what it really means to embody them. In Matthew 10, Jesus says something I think that is really powerful. Um, He says to his disciples, to go and to to go out and to perform miracles, and he says, um, "Go to the lost sheep of Israel, preach this message: the kingdom of heaven is near." He tells them, "Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons," and then he says, "This freely you have received this commission; now freely give." So their ability to go out and do this was rooted in the power and the authority that was given to them. 
and it's similar with our freedom. So here we are in the kingdom, kind of fumbling our way with freedom, because even though we're in the kingdom, we're still situated in the world. Okay? So we're being impacted by sin, and it's not always easy, but we do know that we have a purpose, because we haven't been freed from over here, right, to just just come over here and not do anything. We've been freed for a purpose. We've been freed from sin and suffering to love God, to love people, and to love as Jesus loved. And the ultimate reason, I didn't say this earlier, and that, that when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he says, do this because when you do, when you love each other, the world will then know the God of love. So, freely we have received, let us freely give. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you that you have brought restoration into our lives, God, and that you've brought us out of the darkness and into the light. And God, as we wrestle with what it means to be here, God, would you fill us with your purpose and your heart and your desires for us individually and for us corporately as we seek to represent you to this world by the way that we love you and each other. God, thank you so much for you. For, for meeting us here today. Amen.